How do you propel yourself to great heights as a project manager? One way to propel yourself is by checking out Dr. James Lewis's book, Project Planning, Scheduling and Control. Becoming a project manager has never been easier. The Lewis Institute, helping to certify project leaders. Welcome to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. My guest today was once a previous guest on the show, and he has many years of experience in project management. He's written 14 books on the subject during his career. And in December of last year, 2022, he published the sixth edition of his book entitled Project Planning, Scheduling, and Control. So please help me welcome to today's show, joining us all the way from Asheville, North Carolina, Dr. James Lewis. Welcome, James. Welcome to you as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You have a new book, so I thought we'd talk a bit about the book. And uh, we'll start off by asking, what is the Lewis Method? You talk a lot in the book about the Lewis Method and how it can help PMs avoid project pitfalls. So what exactly is the Lewis method? Well, essentially it's a step-by-step -step procedure for planning, scheduling, and controlling all the work to be done on a project. And it's displayed as a flowchart uh, in the book with uh, decision-making loops in it where it, it, you ask, uh, is this strategy okay? And if the answer is yes, it, it takes you up to another step. And if it says no, it takes you to a, a different step. And if you follow this uh, this model, it does more than most models of project management because most models focus on nothing but the tools of project management, uh, how to create a schedule, how to create a work breakdown structure, how to do earn value analysis. This model actually up in step four, the little blue zone up near the top, asks you questions about stakeholders and the people issues in the project because those are the ones that tend to sink a project. You very seldom see a project fail because a critical path diagram isn't up to par, but you will often see them fail because of people issues. And uh, so if you follow these steps, uh, it does help you avoid the uh, more common pitfalls of not looking at stakeholders correctly, not doing a proper SWOT analysis, et cetera. And you'll notice down the left-hand side of the uh, flowchart, these are the five stages or uh, steps of all projects from initiating through planning, through execution and control and closeout. And uh, it forces you, if you follow the model, to do a lessons learned review at the very end, down in step 15. And uh, you don't consider the project finished until that lessons learned review has been done. That way, you can take advantage of the positives and the negatives of a project on the next job that you do. Um, it, it also has uh, decision points for all kinds of contingencies. If a project is in difficulty because you chose a bad strategy, it'll help you see that. If your uh, strategy is okay, but the implementation plan is defective, it'll help you to see that. So uh, it's been tested in all kinds of project environments from a marketing company in Sweden to uh, pharmaceutical companies all over the world, including uh, England, uh, Canada, and the United States. And uh, it's been proven to work quite well. You also mentioned in, in your book that you have as much authority as you're willing to assume. Mm -hmm. And if you wait for someone to give you authority, it may never happen. So how do PMs really assume authority? And what benefit does this bring us? Well, there's an old saying that it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. And... Uh, I had a boss in my early days as a project manager who traveled all the time. And so decision points would come up and he wouldn't be there to make the decision, yet it would have normally been his role to do so. 
And I read this in a book. I think it may have been by Peter Drucker. I don't recall now. And I started asking myself, if he were here, what would he decide? And I would take those steps. And I got my hand slapped a time or two over seven or eight years. But I also credit it with having uh, moved me up from an entry-level job to a chief engineer's job in seven years. So you just act like you have the authority. And unless you do something egregious, it generally works. It generally works. Well, if you if it's happened only a few times for you, I guess it's an example that it does, certainly does work most of the time. Yeah. Now, you in your book also, you compare managing a project to flying a plane. You say, get it in the air, keep it in the air, make it go where you want it to go. And you mentioned Peter Drucker, and he also says, um, like pilots, managers must be proactive. They've got to be assertive. They've got to take initiative. So how can PMs best navigate through projects? Well, of course, the Lewis method is is designed to essentially answer that question to some degree. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't explain the how of every step. It tells you what you should do, but not necessarily how. That's why we have courses that uh, go into all that detail. But one of the things that is really important is that you don't practice command and control. You practice participative management to the degree possible. Best yet, you follow the situational leadership model of uh, Percy and Blanchard. So at the very early stages, you're fairly directive and and uh, established boundaries and guidelines and so on. Uh, as the team matures a bit, goes from forming to storming, uh, you do a lot of conflict resolution uh, where you reassure the team that you're on the right track and that uh, that you're going to get them there uh, because that is your job as the pilot is to get them there. And they might have to do a lot of the flying of the plane, but you're going to navigate. And then uh, as you move from uh, storming to norming, uh, they begin to take some pride in what they're doing and they begin to understand that uh, they are a team and they're working together. And by the way, don't ever buy team jackets with names and things like that until you get them up to at least that step. Because if you buy one in the early stages where they're still forming, they say, what for? I don't want to be a member of that team. It's not a, even a team yet, to tell the truth. And then, of course, the last stage is, is performing. And at that point in time, they really are, as we might say, cooking with gas. And uh, so your job is to guide them through those those steps. And I will tell you, in that storming stage, they tend to play get the instructor or get the leader. And so they start challenging you. Are we really doing the right thing? Are you calling the shots? At, sir? Who's making decisions? Who has power? Who's in control? And so it. This is one reason I say it's a people job. In fact, I trademarked the term projects for people for that very reason. It's not a technical job. Technology is what the people do. And so you need all the people skills you can get. You've also talked in your book about this high performance project management model. It's all about zero defects should be our target. Can you explain more about this high performance project performance, sorry, high performance project model? and how it benefits PMs? Well, back in my uh, graduate school days, I read about a, a, a psychologist over in England named Eric Trist, who worked in the coal mines to develop what he called uh, socio-technical systems designs, where he said, okay, we got people and we got technology and we got to integrate the two to get best results. He was right, but he left one out. It's actually tools, people, and systems. And if you draw a Venn diagram like the one you just put on the screen, you'll see the, the three of these things, tools, people, and systems. And at the intersection, D, as it's labeled on that diagram, that's where good project management occurs. And one of the things that people are inclined to do in systems is suboptimize. Uh, Dr. Edwards Deming talked a lot about this and said, 
if you sub-optimize, you're going to create problems. And sub-optimization, he used the example of it. If we were to go around the world and we got the, uh, we're going to we're going to design a car and we get the world's best engine and the world's best transmission somewhere else and we get the world's best body and we put all that together, the chances are it's going to blow up. It's the the engine's going to be too big for the transmission and won't fit in the engine properly. They have to be jointly designed so that they work together properly. So as an example in projects, one of the things that companies do is they go out and buy the world's best scheduling software. Oh boy, we, we just got Primavera. You know, you can schedule 10,000 activities down to a three second increment. And they then give the people no training in how to use the software. They expect them to learn that on the job. And the the rule is that the more power a program has, uh, the more difficult it is to learn, the difficult, more difficult it is to master and the whole bit. And so they've sub-optimized. They've made a, a, a monster out of this whole thing. So this really does apply to projects. We need to make sure our people have the training and all the other... In fact, if you can put the diagram back up for just sure. a moment, you'll notice in the boxes that point to the to the Venn circles uh, up there in people, you need to deal with training and development, get them PMP certified. That is the ones that are running projects, uh, work on team building, coaching and mentoring, uh, support them from management's point of view. Be sure you clarify authority, responsibility, accountability. And you need to have selection criteria for the positions that the people occupy and so on and so on. The boxes are self-explanatory. And so each of those boxes must be optimized to work together with the other two. So, for example, in box in uh, intersection A between tools and people, again, you gave them a great tool, but you didn't give them any training in how to use it. So you've sub-optimized. And between tools and systems, uh, if you have a reward system that rewards people for doing something incorrect, you're going to get a bad result. In other words, whatever you rewarded is what gets done. So if you reward the wrong thing, you're going to get the wrong thing. And that's an example of what high performance project management is all about is, is uh, jointly optimizing those three components. That's amazing. Thank you for explaining that. And to close off, I'm curious if anyone out there wants to get in touch with you, how can they do so, James? Well, uh, there's two ways. If you go to my website, which is uh, www, and the, unfortunately, the www needs to be in there because it's not hosted on a standalone system. It's hosted with Kartra. But if you go to uh, lewisinstituteinc.com, and uh, that all has to be there, lewisinstituteinc.com. Uh, there is a contact us, uh, which allows you to go to my uh, appointment scheduling calendar and schedule an appointment to talk with me on either phone or Zoom. Or you can email me, and there is a, an Ask Jim uh, at I think it's outlook.com, but I, I would have to check that. But there is an email address there as well as uh, the, the website has the contact uh, link. Great. Fantastic. Well, thanks for coming on the show once again, uh, James. It's been quite a long time, and I'm glad you've come back to explain some really, really important points that are in your new book. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. Have yourself a great day. You too. Take care.